Hey everyone, Echo Grande back for more action-packed action. Because wow, even though I thought I knew where this season was going to head, it always knows how to throw us a bone. But we'll get to that later on to the summary. So the actual Game of Thrones is being discussed at Dragonstone. Danny gets a little mad queen on us when she starts questioning the loyalty of everyone around her. Surprisingly, she backs Varys into a corner and starts questioning him about his allegiance. First time someone like Varys has ever been backed into a corner, I reckon. Danny does have some good points though, considering Varys always seems to side with the winning side. And then out of nowhere, threatens to burn him alive if he ever betrays her. And I thought Cersei was going to be number one on the candidacy for Mad Queen this season. Things get even more hectic when Melisandre, of all people, shows up to pledge her own loyalty to the Mother of Dragons. I have to admit, this is probably the most distant connection this show has made since Jon and Sansa reunited back in season six. And that's just the first one in this episode. There are a few more that come popping up. Now, if you don't recall, Melisandre was exiled from the North when Davos found out that she sacrificed Shireen, Stannis' daughter. Davos was able to talk Jon into kicking her out, and she left without question. Now this got me thinking that the alliance between Melisandre and Jon, considering she's the one who brought him back to life, was officially broken. And I did expect her to show up with another player in the game. But the last thing that I expected was for her to still vouch for Jon, considering that he's now named King of the North. Danny sends a raven requesting Jon come to Dragonstone and meet with her. And to bend the knee. Second episode in a row this season for someone to ask that of Jon. Can't say he wasn't already perturbed by Cersei's request, now he's got Danny getting up all in his business. This, ladies and gentlemen, I think is the first sign of tension that Jon and Danny's first meeting won't be as pleasant as we're hoping it would be for two of the show's leading protagonists. Meanwhile in Winterfell, Jon and Sansa receive said raven. They see that the letter was written by Tyrion Lannister, and Sansa shares her own doubts that it's even him writing it. And here comes another great callback to the earlier seasons. Jon notices a signature at the bottom and knows it's Tyrion because it's something that Tyrion had told him when they first met in season one. The signature at the bottom reads, all dwarves are bastards in their father's eyes. So there's proof that it is in fact Tyrion, but Jon still has its own doubts that Tyrion can still be trusted. But then Sansa gives her own contribution and Tyrion's heart of gold comes full swing. When Sansa vouches for him after he treated her so kindly and respectfully when they were married back in King's Landing. Even more pieces added to the puzzle that will be complete when we get all of our main characters in the the same room. Sarcasm. Meanwhile, Cersei is busy drilling the southern houses, including Randall Tarly, Sam's father. Cersei points out a lot of Danny's misdeeds, including how she crucified the masters and fed some of them to her dragons. You know, the more I think about it, the more I realize Danny's conquering of Essos wasn't all unicorn and rainbows. Duh. When Randall Tarly chimes in on how Cersei's gonna deal with Danny's dragons, Kyburn chimes in with his own solution. No doubt he's probably got some medieval anti-aircraft gun built. Turns out we're right when Kyburn reveals a giant ass crossbow to Cersei. And he asks Cersei to demonstrate this technology by shooting it at a dragon made of stone. Wait, giant crossbow, jagged spear arrow, lack of emotion or empathy to what's going on in the scene, lackluster pacing during the action, shooting at something that is entirely farce and doesn't really exist. My god, this is the first 10 minutes of The Hobbit 3 all over again. Meanwhile, Samuel Tarly and Archmaester Butterman are tending to a very scaly Jorah Mormon in his hospital room. Turns out the grayscale infection is getting worse and is probably beyond any form of curing. By the way, if you've got trypophobia, might want to take caution during this scene. Sam tries to argue that the grayscale is in fact curable because he remembers Shireen, whose grayscale was cured when she was a baby. Archmaester Butterman strongly disagrees and it looks like this is the end of Jorah Mormont. But there is one beacon of light when Sam finds out that Jorah's last name is of House Mormont. Considering he remembers his father as the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Freaky connection number two in this episode. Back at Dragonstone, Danny is counseling with the leaders of the houses who all have joined her. Olena Tyrell is there, Missande is there as always, Yara and Theon Greyjoy. And then Alar- <laughs> Alaria Sand is there as well. Looks like we'll finally get to see the household of House Lannister, as Tyrion proposes sending the Unsullied to Casterly Rock. Daenerys and Elena Tyrell have an interesting private conversation, where Elena advises Danny to act more like a dragon. Are we really trying to turn Danny into the real Mad Queen here, or is it just me? Anyway, Grey Worm and Missande have their own private chat, where we get some serious acting chops from Jacob Anderson. Not gonna lie, if it wasn't for the shitstorm that happens later, this scene between Grey Worm and Missande would be my favorite of this episode. Because Grey Worm shows some serious emotion here. A little freaky deaky starts to unravel as Grey Worm and Missande get their groove on before Grey Worm has to leave for Castle Rock. On the off chance there are kids watching this, I'm gonna put a little something in just for the adults. 
to the Citadel, Sam once again claims he knows how to cure Grayscale after doing some research, but Butterman shuts him down when he reveals that the maester who discovered this cure died by Grayscale himself. Jorah is writing a letter to Danny when Sam comes in rolling in a cart of medical supplies, asks Jorah to bite down on a leather belt and starts to go ham on his Grayscale, peeling it off one piece at a time. Hope you remembered your spit bucket, cause this shit is disgusting. On to happier thoughts, when Arya is still traveling in the south, when she runs into her old friend, Hot Pie. Hot Pie tells her how Jon Snow took Winterfell back from the Boltons and now rules as king in the north. Arya's face goes from denial to bewilderment to a little sign of joy when she hears this news. There's a reunion we're all wanting but probably not gonna get, and with that decides to head north to be with her half-brother. This isn't gonna end well, cause we all know what happens when Arya gets within 10 miles of any of her family members. John announces his first raven that he received from Sam, addressing how Dragonstone has a large dragonglass deposit under the dragon-inhabited Dragonfort. He also announces the raven he received from Danny, requesting his audience at Dragonstone, and he says he will go to her. But the Northmen disagree, seeing as Danny is still a Targaryen and they still remember the days of the Mad King. Lyanna Mormont, bless her heart, unfortunately also agrees that John should stay in the North. Rebellion on all fronts as John is once again pressed against the wall. All of his loyal correspondents disagreeing with him going to see Danny, indicating that they probably don't want to take her side. Is it bad that I'm now imagining Lyanna being a midnight snack for Drogon if she doesn't decide to side with Danny? Sansa also argues against it, but Jon counters when he puts her in charge while he's gone. This surprisingly shuts Sansa up when the whole room goes quiet. Just goes to show Jon Snow may know nothing, but he still knows how to play the game very well. Jon comes across Littlefinger in the catacombs where Littlefinger starts to sweet talk Jon a little bit. Jon is having none of it when Littlefinger starts to intimidate him. This goes royal out of hand when Jon grabs him by the throat and pins him against the statue of Ned Stark. Okay, probably my favorite throwback of this entire episode because it calls back to when Ned grabbed Littlefinger by the throat and pinned him against his brothel, creating a stronger surrogate connection between Jon and Ned Stark. Jon tells Peter that if he ever tries to talk to Sansa again, he will kill him. A uh, conflict I did not expect to blossom so quickly, but blossom it did. I can't say Jon Snow wasn't already in Peter Baelish's sights, but I'm pretty sure this little ordeal tighten those crosshairs. In the forest of the north, Arya has set up camp when she starts hearing weird noises around her. And just like Liam Neeson in the Grey where he gets surrounded by wolves, Arya gets surrounded by wolves. That are grey. With one wolf being <laughs> slightly bigger than the rest. It does become a very heartwarming moment though because Arya approaches the direwolf thinking that she has reunited with Nymeria. Gotta admit, I could have probably sliced the tension in this scene with a dull butter knife. The whole time Arya was approaching the direwolf I kept thinking it was gonna lunge and gnaw her head right off. And I wouldn't be surprised cause that shit can happen in this show. The direwolf does indeed calm down, but instead of coming to Arya, it just turns around and the whole pack leaves her, leaving Arya to smile and optimistically deduce that it probably was not Nymeria. Come on Arya, Nymeria is one of like three direwolves still alive south of the wall. Ten dozen theory channels are already writing their thesis on how that actually was Nymeria. Within the Greyjoy fleet, Yara pulls a hat trick and adds Alaria San to her roster of flirtation ships, while an uninterested and surprisingly stoic Theon watches from afar. Interesting turn for Theon's character, yet I quite enjoyed it, when suddenly a loud boom is heard in the distance and the ship quakes beneath everyone's feet. Yara and Theon go up to investigate where they find Euron's fleet has ambushed theirs. Cue the first big action scene of the season as we see some fantastic swordplay. Theon, even though he spent the last 2-3 years of his life as Ramsay's pet, he still knows how to swing a blade. We get another great taste of Yara's fighting action, another great throwback to when she attempted to rescue Theon, and even some decent fighting from the Sand Snakes? Granted the scene's entire palette was nothing but black yellow and a little orange, so we probably couldn't see much in detail. But I actually enjoyed the fighting choreography put on by Auburn's illegitimate daughters. Felt like I was watching the Mountain vs. the Viper again as the Sand Snakes took on Euron Greyjoy one by one. But of course, seeing as we know how the former turned out, I've got a pretty good idea of what's gonna happen in the latter. Euron dispatches of two of the Sand Snakes before he takes on Yara and the two duel it out. This scene, I think, is where we finally get a clear sense of just how insane Euron Greyjoy really is. In the novels, I know he is described as looking always crazy with a black smiling eye, meaning his eye patch, and always a perpetual taste for madness. And here, I think we get a full dosage of that. Especially when Euron takes Yara captive and threatens her in front of Theon. And Theon. <sighs> Ugh. 
Turns out the majority of Theon's mind is still infected by his Reek persona, when instead of fighting Euron, he jumps into the water like a coward, leaving Euron to sail away on the Black Pearl, seeking the Fountain of Youth using his magical compass. Now, let's take a moment to give thanks to Episode 2 for giving us a great battle by having it end in a semi-stalemate. Not for the people on screen, mind you, that was flat out a Euron victory. I say stalemate for us as the viewers, because yes, Euron practically destroyed Yara's fleet, and he crippled the morality of Yara's troops by taking her hostage, as well as kidnapping Ilaria Sand and the only living Sand Snake, Tyene, Bronze girlfriend. But that's it! No throat slashing, no deaths of real importance. What about the other Sand Snakes? Over Shut up. This really isn't as tragic as we'd like to think it is. Yes, Theon turned tail and run, but I think he did it for good reason. Maybe yes, he's got a little reek in him. Yes, maybe he always was a coward. But personally, I think he jumped off the boat because it gave Yara a fighting chance. I mean, look at the way everybody was positioned. If Theon charged directly at Euron while he had Yara captive, there's no doubt Euron was going to cut Yara's throat before Theon got even within 10 feet. That's just my opinion. If you think you got a better one or if you want to argue this perspective, leave a comment below. So yes, we do have our next seasonal villain bearing his fangs, and boy does he bear him in a creative way. And I'll admit again, I did not like Euron in Season 6. He seemed so bland, and yet here it's seemed like someone flipped on the crazy switch. Like Euron was running on power saver mode last season, and this season it's like he's got game booster installed in his mind. I was already sold with his scene in episode 1, albeit how small in development it actually was. That was just the appetizer. Here we get a full entree of Euron's craziness, which I probably enjoyed the most in this episode. Everything else was pretty cookie cutter, something I would expect from a shorter Game of Thrones season, but it all still was very enjoyable. The connections they made this episode were exponential to say the least. The foreshadowing of a John and Arya reunion is very touching, but again, and let's not forget, John's probably not going to be there when Arya arrives because it seems like he's heading straight for Dragonstone. And again, I really don't think this is going to end well. But again, we're just two episodes into this shit, so God only knows what's going to happen next. All in all, with this shorter season, it seems like they're going down the right path. And if they're already putting major characters like Theon and Yara in peril, I can't wait to see what happens next. But that's really all I got to say about that. Like I said before, if you want to share your own opinions, leave a comment below. Can't wait to do next week, seems like it's going to be an interesting one, and I'll see all you guys then. Thanks for watching everyone, you know what's coming at you. My name is Matt and I am signing out. Ciao.